Hey everyone, I'm Megyn Kelly. Welcome to The Megyn Kelly Show. Today, we have a special episode on true crime, past and present. You heard about the Diddy indictment. There's breaking news in the Brian Kohlberger case. Uh, And we actually have some details on what's gonna happen with Trump's would-be assassin as well. And we've got the perfect guest to cover it all. Matt Murphy is a former senior deputy district attorney in California and current ABC News legal analyst, and he is the author of a brand new book that you're gonna wanna read. It's called, fellow true crime junkies, The Book of Murder, A Prosecutor's Journey Through Love and Death. Murder. That's, do you ever watch, uh, what's that? <laughs> Shetland? Shetland's such a good crime show. It's this, you know, like, UK crime drama, and that's how they say the word murder. That's all I can say, the book of murder uh, by Matt Murth- Murphy. And this is a guy who knows of what he writes because he put the worst prisoners in jail for his entire career. The book is out right now. It just hit, and it is a fascinating read. Don't miss a moment. Subscribe to this show on YouTube and follow me on Insta, Facebook, and X. Imagine waking up one day to find out your home no longer belongs to you, that someone somewhere has stolen your property right out from under you. It sounds unthinkable, but it is a sad reality for some American homeowners and a risk for anyone that owns property. House stealing, that's what the FBI calls it. And it's a form of real estate fraud where scammers leverage loopholes in the system to fraudulently transfer your home's title into their name then take out loans against your property or even sell it behind your back. And by the time you find this out, the scammer's long gone, leaving you, the legitimate homeowner, to clean up the mess. But right now, triple lock protection is available through hometitlelock.com, offering 24-7 title monitoring, alerts, and restoration services. You can sign up today at hometitlelock.com and use the promo code MEGAN for 30 days of protection for free and a comprehensive title scan to make sure that you're not already a victim of this kind of thing. It's promo code MEGAN and hometitlelock.com or just by using the link below. Matt, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, congrats. You came back on during our fraud week and uh, walked us through one of your big cases, and now you're out with this book, and it's a great um, reason to talk about what's in there and some of these other cases. So let me just hit you up on the the ones that are in the news first, and then we'll get to the book. Um, What do you think is going to happen now with this would-be Trump assassin? Because there's a bit of a turf war starting to unfold between Florida and the feds, where Ron DeSantis says he's going to get to the bottom of how the security lapse occurred. And yet the feds say it's our investigation and the FBI will run point on it. We had Eric Prince suggesting DeSantis should not turn over this shooter to the feds. He should keep him in Florida to make sure he doesn't suddenly have an Epstein-like ending. So how do you see that playing out? Well, I've actually been in one of these before, one of these turf battles, and it's interesting. I I think that the way this will shake out is that this is uh, known as dual jurisdiction. So both the state has jurisdiction over this and the feds have jurisdiction over this. So it's like the old expression, what is it? Possession is nine tenths of the law. Um, Mm. Florida, I think has the body right now. They've got, they've got the would be shooter. Um, So it's, it's going to be really interesting. One of the things that I think they're going to hesitate about is that right now the, the feds have only essentially brought up gun charges. Uh, They obliterated serial number and a felon obsession of a firearm that doesn't, in, in there are a lot of confidence in in where this case is probably merited to go, and that is attempted murder. Now, attempted murder is a very interesting concept in a case like this because it requires a direct but ineffectual step towards the completion of the act. So the intended act beyond mere preparation. So it's actually, this is almost a law school hypo. When you got somebody who intends to kill somebody, you know, forget presidential candidate, just any other human being who takes, who prepares for it and then takes direct but ineffectual steps beyond mere preparation. Is that satisfied here? I think a lot of people would, would say it is. Um, but then at the same time, you know, attempted murders are also historically difficult to prove. Um, so this is going to be really interesting to see the way this shakes out. Worst I mean, case scenario, there be a defense I of like, I was just sitting on the golf course. What do you mean? I was going to, I was, I was going to shoot birds. I, I mean, we've seen so many crazy things in court, so who knows what they're going to come up with. But yeah, something like that. 
what I think is really interesting about this, and and just in the as everybody has been sort of looking at this case, the first thing every prosecutor is going to look at is is this a John Hinckley type situation? You're going to look at the mental health or the mental stability of of the would be shooter. That's the first thing that whether you're a federal prosecutor or a state prosecutor. Is there going to be some sort of insanity defense? And based on everything I've read so far, that's a non-starter. This guy's functional. He might be wacky, but there's a huge difference between being, um, you know, a loon and being legally crazy under what is known as the McNaughton rule, which means you do not recognize the nature and quality of your acts. So this guy, um, an insanity defense isn't going to play. The next thing, and I guarantee they are furiously doing this behind the scenes, both the, the state guys and the federal guys, everybody's looking for, essentially is there, there's two types of assistance in cases like this. There's assistance before, which makes somebody a principal to the crime or a co-conspirator. And they're, I, I guarantee they're looking at every, every machine he's got, every phone, every computer, trying to track down if there's any accomplices in a conspiracy type context. And then there's help after the crime or accessory after the fact. That's anybody who attempts to destroy evidence or hide things. And I, I mean, the weight of the world is going to come down on on this investigation, uh, be it state or federal. And um, anybody involved is going to be in, in a whole lot of trouble. But this yeah. also could be a guy who acted alone. This isn't another thing is that just drives me crazy as long as anybody else has been in law enforcement or the military is this gun keeps being described. The, the rifle he had is an AK-47 style rifle. And it's not. This is an SKS. It's a totally different kind of gun. They fired the same ammunition. But it's a cheap, uh, readily available rifle that also um, everybody should be aware of. He was not entitled to have. He was a convicted felon, so nobody can legally sell him that firearm. So this is going to mm. be interesting to see where it goes. Oh, so that, those people could potentially be in trouble, whoever sold it to him. Um, could he argue, Matt, I, I wasn't going to kill anybody. This isn't like Butler, where the shooter fired shots and took a man's life and hit Trump. The, could he argue, I, I wanted him to listen to me about Ukraine. My plan was to get him you know, to a point where he was scared and just to hear me out. Now, I realize he had a GoPro and he had, they said, they call it ceramics in his backpack, which my understanding is, I just, I just learned yesterday, is some sort of like defense mechanism. It's like to help him be bulletproof if he took fire. But that shows only that he was worried about somebody shooting him, not that he was necessarily going to shoot someone. So couldn't a clever defense attorney potentially get him off on an argument like that since he didn't actually pull a trigger? Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that we're going to see something almost exactly like that. And also, that's another thing that drives everybody crazy that's mirroring it. They keep calling it ceramic tiles. Ceramic tiles are what you have in your house or in your kitchen. Yes, these are called that's right. these are called ceramic plates, and that is a um, that that defeats high caliber ammunition. So our soldiers in the military wear ceramic plates, and certain law enforcement wear ceramic plates as well. So it's not tiles; it's ceramic plates. Everybody. So that's mm -hmm. a um, that that also shows preparation. And you're right; that shows that he's preparing to engage in a gun battle. Where you know you can wear soft armor is what it's called that will defeat handguns, um, but plates are for rifles like those carried by the Secret Service. So this was there, there's at least initially here, um, and this is all you know based on what's just come public. But this is a it appears to be a very planned out scheme. And you're right, we we are at some point we're going to hear some defense lawyer, whether it's in state court or whether it's in federal court, coming out and saying he just wanted his attention or. You know, he didn't really want to do it, blah, blah, blah. But I, I think based on the evidence we have so far, they, they this was a 7.62 magazine with uh, with live ammunition in it. So um, good luck with that one, especially with a Florida jury. Um, and they're I, probably I finding that. his writings, emails, diaries and so on showing intent. We've seen intent even in right. his own self-published book that he wanted Trump to be assassinated. But so we'll see. There'll be more of it. OK, let's shift gears yeah. again. The name of Matt's book is The Book of Murder. It's not about these cases, but the reason Matt can speak so intelligently about these cases is he's a lifelong prosecutor in Orange County. He did dozens of felony criminal prosecutions in one year, um, never mind all the lifetime that he's devoted to it. Some of the worst serial killers on Earth put behind bars thanks to Matt. 
and he talks about it in the book of murder. Let's get to P. Diddy because this news hit and it, this is big. So he finally did get arrested. He's in federal custody, um, charged with racketeering conspiracy, multiple acts of kidnapping, arson, bribery, tampering, forced labor, prostitution, uh, transportation and inducement of travel for purposes of prostitution and other illegal sexual activities, multiple offenses, in, including the possession with intent to distribute, distribution of narcotics, controlled substances, including cocaine, oxycodone, and others, sex trafficking by force this is the second count, and transportation to engage in prostitution. The allegations are deeply disturbing, talking about how he used to have something called, well, not used to, but he has been hosting something called Freak Offs, uh, where they said he used his business, his enterprise, to intimidate, threaten, and lure female victims into his orbit under the pretense of a romantic relationship at oftentimes. The, he then used force, threats of force, and coercion to cause victims to engage in extended sex acts with male commercial sex workers, referred to as freak-offs. These were elaborate and produced sex performances that Combs arranged, directed, masturbated during, and often electronically recorded. He kept the videos he filmed of the victims engaging in these sex acts. And he says uh, law enforcement, this says law enforcement seized various freak-off supplies, including narcotics, 1,000 bottles of baby oil and lubricant, and that among other things, he hit, kicked, threw objects at, dragged victims at times by their hair, uh, and threatened them to ensure continued obedience and silence. Among other things, he engaged in abuse of people who crossed him or, or said they would speak out, including kidnapping and arson. I mean, that's one humdinger of an indictment, Matt. It, it reads like a novel by itself. Um, uh, it's this is uh, this is going to be a fascinating case to watch for a variety of reasons. But we're talking about federal sentencing guidelines. So what that means is even the kind of the throwaway counts where you're talking about um, the narcotics with firearms, that alone, if nothing else, um, winds up a conviction um, that alone carries such incredible um, potential federal sentences, um, you know, just being possession of schedule one narcotics with the intent to distribute along with firearms by itself, you know, he could spend decades in prison for that alone. I think that what's different on this case also, Megan, is that we've, we've, we've read about these civil cases. And of course he was charged with a shooting uh, back in the day. This is, he's been charged under what's called the man act, or that's, um, that's essentially sex trafficking. But also there appear to be RICO allegations in here, which is a, a criminal enterprise. And when you're talking about criminal enterprises, what the feds love to do and what every prosecutor loves to do really is you you look for people who are have criminal jeopardy in the complaint. In other words, they're part of the enterprise transporting these women or distributing narcotics, whatever it may be. And they are now in legal jeopardy. And you go to their lawyer and say, hey, do they want to be a witness or do they want to be a defendant in this thing? So I think that what we can expect is we're going to see confidants and people that are a part of this enterprise turning evidence against Diddy. I think that's what we can see. And I mean, I shouldn't call him Diddy, Mr. Combs, um, but mm -hmm. he is uh, he's in a lot of trouble here. And and mm -hmm. I'll tell you another thing. The feds don't like to they don't like to take a lot of risk. And when you're talking about that word video. Um, you, you know, that's one of the things about sex offenders that I, it's it's always mind boggling, but they love to record it. And it is, you know, when they did the when they served the search warrant in his home in Los Angeles, remember that? And the Bearcat trucks yeah, went in, in and they, they were seen they were seen leaving with computers. And everybody in law enforcement at that point saw those videos and said they're going to do a complete forensic workup. And the FBI is actually the best in the world at getting into electronic devices and figuring out how to get past, you know, passwords and all that sort of thing. And um, the, the timing of this is interesting. I think that this was, it appears to be a very methodical, careful investigation. And this indictment is just mind blowing. Uh, one quick question about the number of celebrities in his orbit, because he was known, is known for these massive parties, like days long, there, this video when he first got his house searched recirculated as if he were threatening the celebrities, like, I'm going to spill the tea 
on all of you. It turned out to be um, the invite list, I think, for his 50th birthday party. But we re it up just to give you a feel for this guy's friend group. Okay, watch a bit of this. Are you ready? Drum roll. He's got his child on his lap for the listening audience. Drake. J-Lo. J-Lo. A-Rod. A-Rod. Will Smith. Will Smith. Alicia Keys. Okay, so you're the prosecutor in this case, let's say, and you know those are the circles this guy runs in. Those are the attendees at his 50th birthday party. And some of those people almost certainly knew about some of this stuff. His penchant for drugging women, for hurting women, abusing them, and so on, these so-called freak-offs. And how does that dynamic of these very powerful, well-known celebrities with lots of money, which frankly is probably how Diddy stayed out of law enforcement's crosshairs for this long, how does that play into how you view this case? Well, this is going to be obviously a hugely sensational trial. With these charges, this is not the type of thing that is going to plea either. This is going to trial. I can virtually guarantee it. Um, And then you start thinking about the witness list. Now, from their perspective, we kind of saw a little bit of this with the Jeffrey Epstein case, right? There was, he got convicted in Florida and he had all kinds of people in his orbit for a while. And he was taking the jet, putting people on his plane and all that stuff. Almost all of them stopped contact with him after he was convicted in Florida. But then he got a whole new group of people, including a lot of socialites here in New York City, that didn't seem to mind this, this, sex, this sex conviction. So, We're going to see something similar here where I think we're going to see a lot of people trying to distance themselves from him. Mm -hmm. Now, what is fascinating here is somebody leaked that hotel video from 2016 with his girlfriend, Cassie. And we've all seen that by now. And I think that we all kind of, you know, you talk about a fall from grace, you know, um, but we've we've seen this before when famous people get in trouble like Bill Cosby or Simpson. And you just we have this public persona or this public image that we, we have a hard time wrapping our head around. Then we saw that video and that video is telling the audience this outside. is him abusing his now ex-girlfriend. It's disturbing to watch. She is 100 percent expected to be a witness against him. Keep going, Matt. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we think we know somebody's public persona. Right. And and it's really hard to wrap our head around it. And then you see in, in that video, he's in a towel and he's beating her and kicking her as she's trying to get out of a hotel room. And he's kicking her on the ground. And it's like, ooh, uh, that's highly corroborative. Now, a thing that is disturbing me as a as an L.A. resident is a lot of this stuff happened in the city of Los Angeles. And we have we have a very progressive D.A. named George Gascon, who seems to be only interested in prosecuting police officers. So there's a permissive atmosphere in vi- regarding violent crime in the city of Los Angeles right now. And a lot of this went down in L.A. Where was the L.A. D.A. in this? You know, again, we have the feds coming in to do this. And there are certain crimes on this indictment that can only be federal crimes. But one of them is an arson that took place in Los Angeles County. And this is this is kind of what happens when you have lax law enforcement um, like we have under D.A. George Gascon in Los Angeles. There's he's up for election coming up. And any of your listeners who live in Los Angeles County, if you're concerned about things like abuse against women or abuse against children or sex trafficking, um, you take a take a hard look at that election and decide how you're going to vote because George Gascon and the DA's office should have been all over this and they had nothing to do with this investigation and it's disturbing to me. They're disgraced. They're humiliated. the The notion, though, that you can have these two faces, you know, your public face, which is this great guy who's so beloved by everyone and brings us this amazing product in in music, uh, but behind the scenes could be potentially a devil is disturbing to most people. You know, that's we kind of bank on that not being at least a common thing. But that describes so many of the characters in your book, the real life people. It's called The Book of Murder. It's by Matt Murphy. You can get it now. And that brings me to this guy who, it's amazing, because when I listen to the book, um, it like every dateline I've ever listened to, every 2020 I've ever listened to, Matt Murphy was the prosecutor in half of these cases. You, you'll you know a lot of these cases. You're like, oh my God, this guy was that prosecutor. So many of us know about this particular case. It's called the dating game guy or murder. He didn't murder somebody on the dating game. But here is a man named Rodney Alcala 
on the dating game, 1979. It's a little long. Watch the clip. Seems like a great guy. Let's watch. Well, let's see. Baxter number one is a successful photographer who got his start when his father found him in the dark room at the age of 13, fully developed. <laughs> Between takes, he might find him skydiving or motorcycling. Please welcome Rodney Alcala. Rod, welcome. Bachelor number one. Yes. What's your best time? The best time is at night, nighttime. Why do you say that? Because that's the only time there is. The only time? What's wrong with uh, morning, afternoon? Well, they're okay, but nighttime is when it really gets good. Then you're really ready. A bachelor number one, I am serving you for dinner. Oh. What are you called and what do you look like? I'm called the banana. And I look really good. Uh, can you be a little more descriptive? <laughs> Peel me. <laughs> well, I like bananas, so I'll take one. Number one. That's your number one. All right. Say hello to Rodney Alcala. Rodney, come on and say hello. Congratulations, Rod. You did it with a one answer. Unbelievable. Matt Murphy, you take it from there. Well, it's fascinating, right? So that's a woman named Cheryl Bradshaw. And um, quick sort of coincidence. Um, uh, today, they're, I think they're issuing the first trailers for a movie that Anna Kendrick did. It's her first, uh, for her directorial debut, and she starred in it as well, called Woman of the Hour. And it's about Rodney Alcala. Now, what's fascinating about Alcala, number one, you see there the charm in that clip that we just watched. Rodney Alcala is in the middle of a murder spree that probably took about 100 lives. And when we're talking about, um, you know, we've got an election coming up, right? And uh, my book is not political at all. But when you talk about Rodney Alcala, um, Rodney Alcala received a life sentence in the state of California in, in the 1970s. He kidnapped and raped an eight-year-old girl named Tally Shapiro in 1968. He fled to New York. He got away from that. She miraculously lived after being in a coma for 32 days. They extradited him back to California. He received a life sentence, and he was paroled in 34 months. So he, after 11 parole, years he before murder, that dating game clip, clip, he had been convicted of murdering a child. No, of of, a, of kidnapping an eight-year-old off the street and kidnapping, raping her. Okay. And oh, she's the kid, one who lived. Kidnapping, okay. right. She Unbelievable. Lived, but she's in a coma F for A fail days. by the dating game producers, just FYI, but keep going. I, right, yeah. And they, and they were actually very cooperative. It's Chuck Barris Productions. They were cooperative with law enforcement, I should, I should say. I don't know if any of them are even still alive. But, um, but so that guy gets paroled 34 months for that crime with that little girl. He had a parole violation when they caught him smoking marijuana with a 13-year-old on the cliffs in Huntington Beach, paroled again, and then he was permitted to drive across country. And the lead detective, Craig Robeson, who's now a Superior Court judge, one of the smartest guys I know, estimates that he killed about 100 people. So that clip that we just watched, he's in the middle of a murder spree, finally murdering a 12-year-old girl named Robin Samson in Huntington Beach. The case went up twice. He was convicted, sentenced to death in California. Rose Byrd, who is the old presiding justice of the California Supreme Court, reversed that case, came down. It, he was retried, um, went up through the Ninth Circuit. They reversed it again, and then it wound up on my desk with just the Samso murder. And then we started, no sooner was the ink dry on the return on a remediator, we started getting DNA hits from cold cases in Los Angeles County. And we went up, we prosecuted five here. There was one in Wyoming. He was cleared to a murder in Marin. He's a suspect in two more in San Diego and at least five that we know of for sure in the New York and Vermont areas. So this guy oh was an absolute monster, but you can see how charming he is, which is what is so fascinating about um, serial killers in general. This guy was a true blue psychopath. And, what, and I talk about this in the book, but one of the fascinating things, Megan, about serial killers that a lot of people don't understand is, and I certainly didn't when I rotated into homicide. I thought they were all like Buffalo Bill, you know, like the guy from The Silence of the Lambs, where they're kind of a weird outcast driving a van and living in a creepy house. The truth is um, they're a lot more like what we just saw. They're charming. They're handsome. Rodney Alcala had a genius level documented Mensa IQ. 
Um, oh. This guy was, uh, he had a house with people who loved him. He grew up with, uh, he, he never suffered any sort of abuse. He was a varsity letterman on his high school cross country team. And he was an absolute monster. And a lot of serial killers will target um, sex workers. You know, I think because of the nature of the profession, it's, you know, it's mm -hmm. anonymous and they'll go into dark alleys and they, they really put themselves in a position to vulnerability because the, the, the profession, which is tragic. But Rodney Alcala wasn't, he wasn't doing that. He was following women home from bars. So his victims included a pediatric cancer nurse, um, a computer programmer, a legal secretary, all of these women, they're the, the same people that we know and love in our own personal lives. And he never should have had the opportunity to do that. It's probably, in my mind, it has to be one of the single biggest failures of the California Board of Prison Terms. And we're, we're tracking hard in that direction again in the state of California. And people really need to be aware of that. Right. Releasing prisoners early is all the rage now. But it is disturbing yeah, what, what you're could saying go wrong? because- we, we really want to find like, oh, he was abused or, oh, you know, something tragic happened to him. He had some mental break and therefore I don't need to worry about the people in my life because none of them has that profile. But you're saying you never found the thing, like the snapped moment. This is just a sociopath. I don't know, a psychopath, maybe whatever from birth. It's the guy standing in front of you in line at Starbucks and you'd never know. That's that's what real serial killers are. Um, like uh, another fascinating one is this, and he's accused, he's presumed innocent, just like everybody else we talked about today, I guess. But um, Rex Huerman, uh, the Gilgo Beach, yeah. the accused Gilgo Beach killer, this guy yep. ran an architect firm in Midtown Manhattan, not far from where I am right now. And that's, he had a family. Um, they often have successful relationships. Um, they have jobs, they're employed. And a lot of them, like Ted Bundy or Rodney Alcala, are handsome and charming and have big, giant, and, you know, IQs. So it's, um, it's, it is really fascinating um, when you, mm. when you get down into the nitty gritty of those things. And another That's fascinating terrifying. thing about serial killers, they all want to represent themselves. And Rodney Alcala represented did. himself in trial. Against so you. I, against me and uh, my, my co-counsel, Gina Satriano from the Los Angeles DA's office, who I love to death. And we co we co-tried that the LA and Orange County cases. And we'd have to go in and deal with them face to face and I'll tell you what, it was absolutely fascinating because you hear about that and it's like, who would get into a guy's car like that? And then you meet him and you see the charm and you see the intelligence and the humor and you can really get a sense of how um, how manipulative they can be. And I Disarming. dealt with them face to face for six months probably during the course of that trial. And it was fascinating. And it ultimately brought justice to all those families that have been waiting well, for Well, you write in the so book long. about how he thought – right up into your closing argument, which gave it to him, both barrels, that you liked him. So we had to figure out a way. Once he went, it's called pro per. Once he went pro per and he fired his lawyers, um, you know, there are so many technical elements to a capital case trial that you, you basically, I mean, it's really, there's two parts to it. Number one, your obligation is you have to treat them fairly and you have to ensure that their due process rights are scrupulously followed because you want to do that, especially when you're talking about the death penalty. Like the foremost job of a prosecutor is to be fair, even when you're dealing with a monster. But the second part of that is we had to move the trial along and they can gum up the gears so much. So when you went pro per Gina, you know, um, was like, what do we do now? I, I don't want to talk to this guy. And we basically decided that I would be, I would be the good guy. And every time we had to tell him no, which was all the time, I would just, I just blame Gina. And, mm -hmm. you know, so he would ask for 10 crazy things a day and he'd be like, hey, Rod, sorry, man, I don't know. I, I would want her to if I were you. I don't know what her problem is today. She said, no, buddy. Um, that's it. And that's how we've moved the trial along. And, you know, you've got jurors, you've got family members. You have to have some level of efficiency. And that's how we did it. And it was so it was my job basically to, um, you know, to talk to him and, to, you know, to help him put on his trial and to kind of, you know, help them you know, attach exhibits to attach ex evidence markers. And, you know, I basically, um, I mean, you're almost a, strangely an assistant in helping them present their case to ensure yeah. that their constitutional rights are followed. 
But honestly, I thought it was fascinating. I, I thought it was, and, I, and let me share a quick story with you. He, this is a guy who murdered a hundred people and he did it in the most sadistic, horrific ways you can imagine. And we had just sentenced a guy to death row, um, who's a big, scary skinhead. And, um, I didn't know how it worked in, in California at San Quentin. And they don't give us any training on that. You know, strangely, we get training in everything, but we don't, we don't get training on how San Quentin actually operates. And they have different yards. So there's a, an additional classification when somebody's sentenced to death and they go to San Quentin, they have different groups of prisoners from, and they classify them from the most dangerous to the least dangerous. And they, so they're, they're divided up into what are called yards. And I, I asked Rodney one day, I'm like, hey, Rod, what's the deal with guys like Billy Joe that are going up there um, that aren't you afraid of him? Are you afraid that guys like that are going to kill you? And he was almost offended. And he turned to me and he said, I'm on the weenie yard, the name they gave themselves for the lightweights that aren't a danger to staff or each other. Like Scott Peterson is on that. I got a, a few guys that I've sent up that are on the quote unquote weenie yard. And he looked at me and he said, Matt, you know me. I'm not violent. You know, oh fascinating, like little glimpse into the psyche of this guy. Like, I'm not violent. I'm not dangerous to anybody. It's this is a guy who is smashing people's faces in with rocks and raping them repeatedly like this. Uh -huh. He's as violent a human being as you get. He's monstrous. But in his own mind, he's not a danger. He's not violent. So it was it was a fascinating experience. And then, yeah, I got to closing argument and then he realized I was no, I wasn't his buddy. And, and I ripped the them big... as hard as I think I've ever ripped a criminal defendant. Yeah. We actually, we have a little of that. Let's, let's watch. Oh boy. No soul or feelings. <laughs> when you're talking about a guy like that, who is hunting through Southern California, looking for people to kill because he enjoys it. He gets off on the infliction of other, of pain on other people. He put new carpeting in his car. Who does that? What was that about, that last piece? So when they got to his house and served the search warrant, um, he had a, uh, it was almost like, it, it was like a, a mobile crime scene. He had this new Datsun station wagon and he had just kidnapped and murdered Robin Samso probably two weeks before. And when we got there, all of the, fern, all, all of the, um, the, the carpeting in the car had been torn out and replaced almost certainly because it was bloody. So there was new, brand new carpeting. There was also binoculars. The windows were heavily tinted before it was fashionable to do that. So it was basically, there were, there were maps. There was everything that you would expect a human predator would have in his vehicle if he was in the business of going out and finding people to get into his car so he could rape and murder them. It was absolutely mm -hmm. fascinating. And then, and then they also, they found a receipt when they did that search warrant to a storage locker, but it wasn't actually listed on the items they could take. So one of these police officers in a very heads up way saw the address of this storage locker receipt and copied it because they couldn't take the document, but it was in plain sight. So we copied it. They transported, I'll call it a Huntington PD and his sister came down and he, he was caught on tape telling her, Hey, you got to get it to my storage locker and empty it. So it was a race and the police got there first and inside his storage locker, they found a, a silk pouch, which was a trophy case, which had earrings and brooches and items of jewelry from, I mean, probably two dozen different women. And every one of them represented um, some murder victim, that, because a lot of times serial killers will collect trophies of their kills. And they it's it's almost like they go to school for it. It's a fascinating thing. So um, there was only one DNA hit and it came back to the legal secretary, Charlotte Lamb, who was brutally murdered in Santa Monica um, during the spree, not not long after um, what we just saw in the dating game. But they also found boxes and boxes and boxes of photographs of young boys, young girls, young women in positions of vulnerability. And we identified maybe half of those over the course of the investigations, hundreds and hundreds of photos of these of these unknown people um, taken by Rodney Alcala. He was a graduate of um, UCLA film school. So he was a professional photographer and he, that was part of his ruse. That was the way he would come in. He would, he would mm -hmm. say he was in a photo contest or you're a model. You, you're so beautiful. Let me take photos. And he would lure them into these positions of vulnerability. And there were just dozens and dozens and dozens of these people. And we never learned who they were. And, and oh, some of God. them we did connect to murders. The one in Wyoming, 
wound up being, she was, she was in his photos. And then we also found a picture of a girl on roller skates, a girl, she was 16, named Lori Wirtz. And it came back, she was connected to the day that Robin Samso disappeared. And, you know, every time a case gets reversed, you can't use the evidence that the court found objectionable. So it came back on my desk when I got it for the third retrial. There was a lot of evidence that had been removed by the appellate courts. And, are, you know, it's proper for them to do that. But um, we had to we had to set the timing in this picture of this 16 year old girl in a bikini on roller skates. We found a, a guy in the Navy that from the posts in the background, like the signposts, the shadows from the signposts, we were able to to actually get, it's like a sundial. And this expert was able to give us the exact time that that photo was taken because the signs were still there 30 years later. They were still in the same cement. And with the wow. Almanac, they were able to tell us the exact time. And from that, we were able to figure out that Alcala was right up Hunting Pacific Coast Highway in Huntington Beach, right before Robin Samso got kidnapped. So I was ready to go oh before we started getting the DNA hits in LA. But when we got those, it, it changed the entire complexion of the case. And, and, and he was convicted. And, he was sentenced to death a third yeah. time. And he died a lonely death in California prison. Good. He suffered. Thanks to Matt uh, and his partner. This story is laid out among many others in the book of Murder by Matt Murphy, which you should get right now. It just hit. I've got to talk to you about Dirty John. That's another one, my fellow true crime readers and watchers. Dirty John, we all know this case, this scumbag who took advantage of all these well-meaning women who thought that they were his only true love, and all he was doing was fleecing them and stealing from them and using them, and then ultimately, he was doing that to one woman who had two daughters, and one daughter actively disliked him and really wanted nothing to do with him and tried to persuade the mom to, Debbie, to get him out of her life. And the other daughter was nicer and tried to kind of go along to get along, but wasn't a fan, but kind of like just the peacemaker of the family. Her name was Tara. And it culminated, as we've seen in the TV special, there were so many movies made about this case, in this guy ultimately attacking Tara once Debbie got smart and kicked him out of her life in a parking lot. And I'll, I'm, I'll tell you this chapter and then I'll let you take it. Tara, the nice one, the quiet one, the sweet one, unleashed hell on this guy. They say be a difficult victim. And it did not go Dirty John's way. She came on my show at NBC News. And here's a clip of her telling the story. First of all, have you, had you ever taken self-defense or anything like that? No. <laughs> so it was, you were going all on instinct? Well, I watch a lot of like criminal mind shows, The Walking Dead. <laughs> We all think that will help us, but in the back of our minds, we tell ourselves probably not. <laughs> so scissor kicks and all that, you like pedal kicks, that was all just instinct and criminal minds. Okay, so. Walking Dead. Well, Walking yeah. Dead, I walking watched dead. that religiously. Yeah. So, so Walking Dead turned out to be critical towards saving Tara's life. Tell us how and why. Um, well, when I got the knife from him, I just like stabbed him. I didn't give it a second thought. I just thought it's like, like it's him or me. Um, and then also the last one was to the head and I think that's like, oh, the zombie kill. <laughs> it's amazing. How can, how can you talk about it so matter of factly? Lots of therapy. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable, Matt. You prosecuted that case, you handled that case, but boy, oh boy, Tara put an end to that guy. Yeah, isn't that incredible? Um, you know, that was, uh, I had a couple of years left in homicide when that whole thing went down. So that was a homicide that took place in Newport Beach. And the way Orange County was set up is it's called vertical prosecution. So you, when you rotate into sexual assault and then for me, then homicide, um, you get assigned a certain patch. So Newport was one of my cities. So every murder or every homicide that happened was essentially my responsibility to ensure the investigation was complete. And I would review it for the filing of potential criminal charges. So we would roll out to these crime scenes at the very beginning, my investigator and I, and you work with the same detectives over and over again. And it really is, I think, a superior model for um, homicide prosecutors and detectives. So that was in Newport. That was one of mine. And I got the call from the detectives on that. And, you know, the fundamental job of a prosecutor is to achieve justice. It's not to get convictions. It's to achieve justice. And sometimes 
Um, that means your job is to clear somebody of any and all legal culpability for an event. And that one was one that quickly, I mean, you, you see Tara is just a lovely human being. She's since become a friend of mine. I mean, and, and so my job basically was to make sure that, 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 that she was cleared of all, um, of all criminal responsibility for that because mm -hmm. this guy was trying to kill her. And inside his car, we found that there was a, um, it was basically a, a catch and kill kit. There was, there was duct tape, there was a loaded firearm, um, there was handcuffs. He was going to kill her. And, and after 17 years in homicide, I can tell you that story ends one way over and over again. And it ends up with the, the poor young woman in a ditch or down the side of some hillside. And that's how that story ends. And she's coming home with her dog. She had an Australian shepherd named Cash. And John Meehan, who I think weighed 245 pounds, and it was athletic size too. This is a big athletic guy who was going to murder her. To, it's called filicide. He was going to murder her to get revenge against her mom for divorcing him. And the dog bit him and the fight was on. And it was, there was a picture taken um, of Tara in the hospital bed because she was stabbed multiple times as well um, with that dog on her lap. Like she's on the bed and the dog is sort of on, on the foot of the bed, eyeing the photographer in the suspicious way. Like Aww. I will bite you too. If you come near my mom. And um, yeah, just it was a hero dog and a hero would be victim who refused to be a victim. And that was one that, um, you know, it started with online dating. And I, I have a whole section in that chapter on some of the things I learned about um, online dating gone wrong. And a lot of uh, I mean, tragically, a lot of the, the murder cases you deal with in homicide start out where people meet each other online and what are some of the red flags, especially mm. in that case, that guy was so bad and he, but he, he held himself out as a, uh, as an anesthesiologist. And doctor, I'll tell you what, right. for anybody who, who, yeah, for anybody who hasn't seen it, they're Connie Britton and Eric Bana. I think yes. it's lifetime. They put together a series. Eric Bana is absolutely brilliant. And for that, I think there's, when that case went down, I, it was too good a story not to share. So once we cleared it, um, I called my friend Chris Godford at the LA Bravo. Times and, um, and I'm like, dude, you gotta, you gotta share this with the world. And I, I thought he'd write an article about it and went up putting together dirty John. And I think it's got 30 million downloads. Um, oh, the, I had all I mean, the, the movie, I there's eat. a, there's so many podcasts about it, a series podcast series about it. It's a fascinating case. And the, the book, the Book of Murder by Matt Murphy has got some life-saving tips in there from a guy who's been on the good end of dealing with criminality for his whole life. So you, you know, there are many of us who are into true crime. I think because we have issues, we were scared. We grew up in the 70s, whatever. There was a lot of murder everywhere. We're trying to work something out. Um, but so the, it's an interesting read. You find out a lot about human nature, but you can also learn some tips that might save you and be a difficult victim is one of them. So in these two cases that we've talked about, in addition I mean, if you want to hear the Ed Shin, uh, Ed Shin story, you got to go back to our Fraud Week episode from June. But in the two we just discussed, there's one element of the crime solving that was important, and that is the guy's car. What's what was in the car? Like, how how did he lure people along? What how did he use his vehicle? And that is also the case with Brian Kohlberger, the guy accused of murdering these four Idaho students, and. He was amazingly allowed to clean the car while the feds were allegedly watching him. Um, I don't know whether they went and retrieved whatever he cleaned out of the car from the trash can. That's never been admitted if they did. And he just got a change of venue, Matt, from Moscow, Idaho to Boise, I think, maybe Boise. It looks like there's a, an administrative judge at a higher court who's now going to decide exactly where this case should land. And it looks like Judge Judge, the guy who, that's his actual name, who was overseeing this, is asking for this baton to be passed. He doesn't want to have to travel and try it someplace else. The defense sees this as a victory on at least two fronts. Number one, they don't want the case tried in the college town in which the murders were committed. And number two, They've been jumping up and down about genetic genealogy, and they appear to have some suspicion that the feds crossed some unlawful lines in tracking down his name, that they had genetic DNA, they had, that they had 
uh, touch DNA on the knife sheath and that they were able to trace that to his dad in the Poconos. And once you had his dad, you were very close to having him. And the belief may be that the feds somehow got to that name, you know, got from the touch DNA to the name of the father by doing something they shouldn't have. And if that's true, the defense believes it might have grounds to blow up this entire case because everything thereafter, the cheek swab that actually did show it was Brian's DNA, is fruit of the poisonous tree, as we learned about in law school. And you, you probably use that phrase a lot or had it used against you. So what do you make of these latest developments in Kohlberger? So as far as the change of venue goes, this is capital case litigation for the Ninth Circuit. So this is the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal. And it, you know, any death penalty case, and, and they should, they, they undergo the highest level of appellate scrutiny. So when you have a small town like this, the defense's argument was, can we really get a fair trial here? It is very rare that you see a change of venue based on pretrial publicity because you can almost always find it's called a venire. That's a jury pool where you can find 12 fair deliberating jurors. And I think they probably could have done that in the Moscow area as well. But this is sort of an abundance of caution where they don't want this to be an appellate issue. And I think that... Um, for death penalty cases in general in the Western United States, it is, it's a bifurcated system. Okay. So there's, there's a guilt phase and then there's a penalty phase with the same jury. And essentially what the judge's job is to make sure that the defendant gets a fair trial, but really what they're all concerned about is they don't want anything to go up that's even close where the case can be reversed. Rodney Alcala is a perfect example of that because that poor family had to go through that three times and it destroyed them. So what the judge is thinking kind of behind the scenes is he doesn't want that case to get reversed. So when the defense has a as an argument that, hey, maybe we should move this, that was a very conservative, careful decision that I think at the end of the day is not going to have a negative impact for the prosecution at all. And I think it will have a really positive effect for this case on appeal. As far as that DNA of, uh, argument goes, I think that's a loser for the defense. This is something that's been argued over and over again. You're talking about familial DNA. There were other things that that essentially brought the um, the, the focus of suspicion onto Koberger. You know, right. there's video of his car. There's cell phone pings. Um, there, there's plenty of information, but. As a general rule, DNA is not something that you can suppress when it's taken from the defendant. OK, so if you find if, if a search warrant is violated, and you find a murder weapon in somebody's home. You can suppress that. But this is there's a concept known as inevitable discovery. And that yes, exists. In I state argued law this in my well third in my moot court competition back when I was just a wee law go. student and we won. Yeah. Um, Actually, we lost in the finals, but I won a special award. Anyway, <laughs> um, that was the whole thing, inevitable discovery. So if they can show they would have found this guy anyway, then then they can get it in. But so you're saying even if they detected Brian Kohlberger's dad by doing something untoward, by maybe accessing some database they shouldn't have, the feds and so on, that you still like the prosecution's chances because the they were driving at Brian Kohlberger through more than just the DNA on the knife sheath, and it, he would have been inevitably discovered. Yes, and you and the remedy generally for DNA problems like this is you just retest the suspect. You know, he can't, he can't change his DNA. His DNA doesn't doesn't change. So this is one of those things, and this is this is the the cutting edge of um, of DNA forensics. Basically, it's called familial DNA. This, these are the cases that are getting made. Like like one of mine, I prosecuted the Golden State Killer. I was the Orange County prosecutor, one of several prosecutors on that Every case. Every case you've ever so heard of, Matt Murphy was the DA. I mean, that's just the bottom line. Every case, yeah. keep going. The book of murder. Well, you, you, you talk about a monster. Um, the Golden State Killer was was one of the worst yeah. I, I have ever seen. Joseph D'Angelo, just a, a, the man was the devil. But, um, but that was a case that was made with familial DNA. And- there are, and I, there's a bunch of others that didn't have a lot of media. You know, my Neil case out of Newport, which was a, a case from the early 70s, it was a five-year-old girl who was kidnapped and, and murdered. There's there's a whole rash of these things, and they've been challenged, and they have repeatedly been shut down by the courts of appeal. And so 
You know, the Koberger defense team, they're doing what they have to do. I have no criticism for them. They're, that's their job is to ensure that their client gets fair trial and to present whatever issues they can. But they're pretty dramatic about a lot of the things that they're doing. And I can tell you right now, I have, um, that's a, that sounds good. It sounds good, especially to a lay audience that um, his DNA is that the DNA on a knife shift on that knife sheet is going to be admitted against Brian Koberger in that trial. Um, they're not going to be able to successfully suppress it and it will be affirmed on appeal if, if he's convicted. Mm. So um, the reason they're yeah, excited I mean, they, about they the run- new judge is the old judge wasn't giving them all the discovery about that trail that they wanted. And so they're thinking, okay, we'll get a new judge now. Maybe we'll get what we need, but you're saying that they should, they should hold their horses. They should, their, their joy is uh, a little premature. Enjoy it while they got it. I mean, look, they, they, when I was trained, there was a guy named Chris Evans, who's now a Superior Court judge, and I, I love this guy. He was one of my mentors in the DA's office. But I, when I was a baby DA, and I'll never forget it, he came in, and we were learning about providing discovery to the defense. And he said, look, this is really simple. Make sure they have everything. Give them absolutely everything, and then just beat them with it. Okay, so, you know, the defense and Koberger should be entitled to everything. You know, give them everything, and then just beat them with it. You've got – those cell phone pings are – incredibly damning against Brian Koberger. And I've reviewed that data and any competent prosecutor in front of any fair jury, that, that is quite an argument. He turned his phone off in the direction of, of the, of the murders, you know, so he didn't just leave it at home. He took it with him, which is fascinating. I mean, allegedly, of course, he's presumed innocent. I have to say that as an attorney, but look, the guy's a PhD student in criminology and he takes his cell phone with him. And so he's pinging in the direction of the murders. And then he turned it off, which the, the prosecution is going to argue is what's known as consciousness of guilt. And then he's gone just enough time to commit these horrific murders. And then he turns his phone back on before he comes back. And the defense is saying, oh, they can relay and all that. You hear that same defense in every murder case where cell phones are a part of the evidence. And the jury gets it. There's, they're all. It's triangulation. It's not tough. The science isn't tough. They'll put up a map showing him pinging along transponders in the direction of the murder. They'll do the timing. They'll do the drives. They'll show the video of his car because that is his car. That plus the DNA, and I'm sure they have additional things from his computers. But apparently, visited that house multiple times. He appears to have been very interested in, or perhaps obsessed about one of these young women, or maybe more. And, you know, this is a this I think that he went in there, you know, the, at least the prosecution will argue he went in. He wasn't expecting that other poor young woman to be in bed with his intended victim. And, you know, uh, who is it? Mike Tyson, the great philosopher, said everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And that guy went mm-hmm. in and uh, everything went wrong. And um, and and he left and he left that sheath there. That clearly was not a part of the plan. And I think the evidence against him is extremely powerful. And it doesn't matter if it's a jury in Moscow that hears that or Boise or anywhere else in the state of Idaho. They're going to be able to find 12 fair people. They'll assess this. They'll follow the law. And look, I think that the evidence against Brian Koberger is overwhelming, personally. We will be hopefully talking to you a lot as that trial gets started right now. It's slated for June of 2025. It's been delayed so long. I mean, I just can't imagine how much later they could push it. But listen, everybody's got to support Matt. The book is called... The Book of Murder, A Prosecutor's Journey Through Love and Death by Matt Murphy. It's out this week. Matt, thank you. Matt's hosting a live free virtual event on Thursday at 8 p.m. on CrimeCon's YouTube and Facebook channels. That's very cool. Again, live free virtual event this Thursday, 8 p.m., CrimeCon's YouTube and Facebook channels with more stories from his book. Matt, all the best. Thank you so much for having me, Megan. This is always fun. Good luck with it. All right, and we'll be Thank you. right back. Do you owe back taxes or have unfiled returns? Along with hiring tens of thousands of new agents and field officers, the IRS has been sending over 5 million pay-up letters to those who have unfiled tax returns or balances owed. Don't waive your rights and speak with them on your own. Instead, Tax Network USA, a trusted tax relief firm, has saved more than $1 billion in back taxes for their clients, and they might be able to help you secure the best deal possible. Whether you owe 10,000 or 10 million, they can help you. Whether it's business or personal taxes, even if you have the means to pay or if you're on a fixed income, they can help you. Finally, resolve your tax burdens once and for all. Call them at 1-800-958-1000. 
or visit TNUSA.com slash Megan. Don't let the IRS control your life. Empower yourself with Tax Network USA's support and take charge of your financial future. Visit TNUSA.com slash Megan today. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about a very busy week last week. Maybe you noticed we were all over the country doing a bunch of different things, and it was it was great. Had some amazing conversations with some really interesting guys, most of whom you know. I hope and I believe you remember Sean Ryan. What a guest and what a guy. He was on the show back in May. It was such a powerful interview. This is a special man. And then he invited me to go on his show uh, down in Nashville, Tennessee, which I did. And it was very cool. It was the longest interview I've ever given in my life, four hours. <laughs> Um, but it didn't seem that long. Sean has a way of keeping it going, and he's just so thoughtful. He's a great interviewer. Um, and so we wanted to bring you a couple of highlights. What do you think the final nail in the coffin will be? If Trump wins again. That'll be the end. Yes, because they'll do the same thing they did the first time. Everything will be negative. He will be the devil incarnate. They will find their oppositional, you know, media roots again, which they totally forgot during the Biden years. You, you had just mentioned that you were bullied as a little girl. Why were you bullied? Why? Why? That's an interesting question. Um, I think, I think it's because I had a fairly big, not huge, but fairly big personality. So I attracted attention, which is somewhat dangerous when you're young. Kind of always. It could be potentially dangerous. But, you know, when you're young, most kids just want to fly under the radar, have friends. I wasn't trying to get attention. I just had a large personality. What do you think the key to a successful marriage is? I definitely think it's using your most generous lens on your partner trying to interpret all behaviors through the lens of he loves me and I love him. Um, that helps with so many things. And I also think it's important to say the thing that you don't want to say. I have every belief in God and in a higher power and in something more for us on the other side and on the last side, you know, before we got here, as I said. I just haven't figured out how I interact with it. It was a great conversation. It was like therapy for me, frankly, but not traumatic. You know, like Sean knows just how far to push you without pushing you over the edge, or at least that's that was my experience there. But like in that one question, you know, why were you bullied? Isn't that an interesting question? That's how he is. He thinks of questions like that. And what a thoughtful, sweet guy. Loved my time down there. Um, then on Monday uh, last week, I was in Los Angeles to talk to the guys from the All In podcast. You know, our pal David Sachs, he's on the show all the time at their yearly All In Summit conference. Now, I love that they do this because they are actual tech gurus. These guys are billionaires. They're extremely successful. And the only person who's been doing like the really successful tech conference is that villain, Kara Swisher, who is a leftist who hates everyone who's not as far left as she is. So they're giving her a run for her money. They're getting all the big names. Elon was there, and I met him backstage. More on that in a second. Um, so I love that they're doing it at all. And all the people there were these young, smart, successful tech guys and gals. The audience was really dynamic. And uh, I got to know the other co-hosts who I didn't know. I know David Sachs, of course. David Friedberg's been on the show once before. So is Jay Cal. Jason Kalkanis, who, well, you know, there was an incident when he came on, but I like him. And uh, um, Chamath was there as well. And we all sm spoke to close out the first day of their conference right before Elon came on. Here's a look at that. And then what about Hillary versus Kamala? Oh, God. Well, Hillary was smart. <laughs> <laughs> The problem for Kamala Harris is she's not smart. She's not a deep thinker. She's very surface level. Yeah, she's giggling just like that all the time. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Megan, tell us how you feel. Really, be honest. And it's a cover. It's an obvious cover, right? It's like she gets to the point where she doesn't know what she's saying. Even she doesn't know what she's saying. And it's like, ah! <laughs> and so you feel uncomfortable watching her. And then she gave her first interview to CNN. And suddenly, if, if that's drunk Kamala, suddenly we're dealing with hungover Kamala. Like, my values haven't changed. <laughs> like, clearly somebody had told her, you cackle, we're out of here. Yeah. Right? So, what did you think about her bringing her emotional support white guy? Exactly. Her emotional support governor. He was yeah. her big white blankie. Like I, I mean, it made no sense. Like, it seemed like a terrible strategic decision. Like, who's making the decision to do I that? I agree. I objected to the whole thing. I think he was there for two two purposes. Uh, one was, yes, in case she got in real trouble, he could step in. Yeah. And the other was to suck up some of the airtime so she had a couple of fewer questions to answer. We look at the five cases, you know, six months from now, a year from now. Let's assume all five of them go to trial. Um, he's guilty of three so far. Wait, what do, you, what do you mean he's guilty of three so far? Well, he's been convicted about? of three, sorry. What do you mean? No, he hasn't. Um, I love the, this. Ellen, uh, no, E. Jean, Car e. Jean Carroll was guilty. That was not a conviction. That was a civil case. Okay, well, yes, yeah, so that's what I'm talking about. So that okay, one but there's a big difference. It's, it's still he was convicted. He was guilty in the, of that. He got a settlement. Um, in the... Yeah, and the Trump organization, they're guilty there. That, okay, again, was still civil, liable, liable. Uh, yes, of course. But we're, these are the cases we're talking about. And in the third one... Uh, you know she's one, a lawyer, right? Yeah, of course. And in the third one... <laughs> I'm just talking about the five cases. Yes, some are civil, obviously, and, and some, some are not. Some are criminal. But if we look you at all five You said three cases, convictions. Now you're walking it back. I'm not walking it back. There's Get three in which he was... You should walk it back. Okay, I'm guys, so glad it. Megan is here to Of the five, to, to three of them, this. he's either guilty or... You, you know, got a bad result. Yeah, got a bad result. There are two more. If he is found guilty of those two more, Megan, um, and five of five, he had a bad result. Um, way to frame it. Um, will... Will you chalk all five up in your mind to five different jurisdictions, five different prosecutors, five different juries and or judges, all conspiring to get him? 100%. Okay. Yes. <laughs> That's all I wanted to hear your answer to. They're, five they're, of five, five different jurisdictions. Yeah. You think it's all I mean, all E. Jean Carroll, they, they changed the law so that she could bring a civil lawsuit no against problem. him, just, and she did. New York jury, New York went 87% for Joe Biden. That, that, that fix was in right from the start. The fraud trial that Letitia James brought against yeah. him has never been brought. There's no victims. The banks who were involved said, we didn't lose a penny. What are we doing here? We weren't damaged. Yeah. Nobody was complaining except Tish James, who ran for office saying, I will yep. get him. Then you have Alvin Bragg, who's a George Soros-funded prosecutor who doesn't like to prosecute any crime in New York City where I lived for 17 years, except if your name is Donald Trump. Let's go down to Georgia, where Fannie Willis and Nathan Wade couldn't keep their libidos in check long enough to actually bring this case against Donald Trump. It's a repeat of what was happening in January 6th up in the case with Judge Chutkin, who loathes Trump and has sentenced almost every J6 defendant to way more jail time than their counterparts would get. Those are falling apart because of presidential immunity, which was handed down by the Supreme Court, who said you cannot bring a criminal case against a sitting president for any official act. Those cases are, have been gutted. Also, a Supreme Court ruling saying the same on January 6th defendants in general. And that leaves us with Florida and the documents. And Trump has torn that apart because Jack Smith wasn't properly appointed and isn't the right counsel. But there are other issues they haven't even gotten to presidential immunity there. And so th that one's going nowhere as well. And by the way, they're going to peel it up to the 11th Circuit. She just threw it out. The 11th Circuit is conservative. And thank God, so is the current Supreme Court. They're not going to tolerate that nonsense. Let me ask you about... Um I think... Let me... I think, J. Cal, I think J. Cal just lost his right to ever bring up lawfare again. Oh, uh, we had fun. I, you know, I appreciated J. Cal bringing that up because obviously he knew I was a lawyer and he's not. So that was, I think that was him being generous to me. That was him being kind. I appreciated it. Um, and I loved being out there. And I met Elon Musk, who I've never met before. It was very cool. He is truly larger than life. He came backstage and it's like, oh my God, it's like the seas parting. You know, there's Elon and uh, we had a very nice exchange. I said, um, I shook his hand and I said, thank you for saving free speech in America. And he said, same to you, which was very sweet. Uh, but man, he really has, he really has. Think about all the things we can talk about now in, a, in an honest way that we couldn't before he took over Twitter, now X. I'm sincerely grateful to him. I'm sure you know why. I'm sure you can feel it too. And then last Thursday, uh, I completed my nationwide tour in Kansas City, Missouri, 
with my pal Tucker Carlson. He's a live tour right now and asked me to join him in Kansas City, and I was happy to do it. I met so many great people. Oh, my gosh. Normally, you know, you do the photo line, and um, sometimes they push you through those things so fast that, that it isn't fun for anybody. It's not fun for them. But it it was so fun. I loved the photo line. <laughs> I love talking to Tucker. He is such an interesting interviewer. He goes to, you never know where he's going to go. And I think he thinks the chaos of the whole thing adds to it, which I think is true. It's, you know, we had thousands and thousands of people there. Uh, it went over big and had a lot of viral clips that maybe you saw, but uh, loved being together again. It was particularly fun to be sort of on the outside together. Here's a bit of that one. I come here and someone's like, are you going to ask her about Taylor Swift? Okay, I've got so- thoughts. <laughs> so. Screw you, Taylor Swift. <laughs> she turns around. Not only does she pick a side in a hotly contested presidential election, alienating at least half of her fan base, but she says the reason she's voting for Kamala Harris is because of Tim Walz's LGBTQ stance. Do you know what Tim Walls has done on the LGBTQ front? Tim Wal- let me let me tell you what's going to happen, okay? What, here's what's going to happen. A, a little girl sitting in Wisconsin who's maybe on the spectrum, maybe has acne, maybe is a little heavy set, maybe feels upset because the parents are getting divorced, something like that, is going to find herself down a rabbit hole on Reddit. And her parents aren't going to know because they're getting a divorce and they're not focused on her right now. And she's going to spend hour after hour on that thing. And Reddit's going to tell her she's actually a boy. And she's going to get sucked into this gender cult. And she's going to say, Mom and Dad, I want puberty blockers into cross-sex hormones, which will sterilize her and deprive her of all sexual pleasure for the rest of her life. And they're going to say, no, you're a girl. And she's going to say, but I want, to, I want top surgery, this benign thing. This double mastectomy where I'll have tubes coming out of me and I'll never breastfeed a child. I want that too, because I'm a boy. And they're going to say no. And she's going to go to a judge in Minnesota, and because of Tim Walls, the court will take custody of her, use the Medicaid funds in Minnesota to provide her all of those things, chop off her breasts, sterilize her with the puberty blockers under the cross-sex hormones. And when this girl inevitably comes to the conclusion that she didn't want any of this, that it only added to her problems, which were the divorce and the acne and the puberty and not any trans issue, who is she going to go to then? This is all because of Tim Walls. That's what Minnesota is doing right now to little girls and boys, taking custody away from the parents so that they can have these procedures without any loving parent there to help. And that's what Taylor Swift just endorsed for your children. So screw you, Taylor Swift. You were describing how rich Taylor Swift is. Why isn't she happy? Good question. I mean, listen, I, there's, what is she, like 32? I don't know what she is. She's, she's young. She's never had a relationship that works. She makes a lot of money about, off of writing about it. Um, that could be part of the problem. Like, to the, for the reasons you were just discussing. When you find true love, when you have somebody who loves you unconditionally, you know, warts and all, that's everything. And she hasn't been able to find it. She's made a lot of money off of it. And I think she travels from city to city without the grounding that you have, that I have, that hopefully all of you have. And maybe she's feeling untethered. Maybe she's feeling empty and lost. And maybe she wants other people to make similar decisions in life as she has. Mm. By the way, she's 34 years old. Uh, that whole thing is just so annoying. That still brings up something for me, just what Tim Walls is doing, what Minnesota's doing. And it's not just Minnesota. It's just dark, 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 dark. Give me a break on your stupid joy message. You're not causing joy for the kids who are going to get cut up in Minnesota because of you. So God bless Tucker. He talks about everything. Had some interesting moments on Jeffrey Epstein and uh, just such a, kind and generous man. Uh, great to see him again. We've had a long history. We talked a little bit about that too uh, and how we first kind of got to know each other and what our experience was a bit at, as he put it, that place we used to work. Um, at every stop, folks mentioned the success of this show and that is all thanks to you guys. I'm so grateful to you and my team is too. Got to see them out at the All In Summit. We all we all went, a bunch of us, not all of us, but some of us went out there and uh, it was so fun. We talked about how much the audience means 
not just to me, but to my producers too. They know you're out there. They know, like, we all have an image of who we're writing for and producing for and anchoring for. And to see you in person, like I got to at the Kansas City, Missouri event and at the All In event, um, that was really special. Gosh, I mentioned this the other day, but just to actually like touch hands with the folks who are listening and watching, to hug some of the folks who are listening and watching was really gratifying. I feel the connection to you in the same way I hope you feel it to me. So thank you for letting us go on this ride and uh, for being along with us while we all do it together. I think in some areas we're really making a difference, but the real purpose is just to stay informed, keep our senses of humor, and yeah, stay connected. So thanks for joining me today and every day and see you next time.